My name is Erica. It's a pleasure to meet you. The voice. A blink of an eye. Human-like responses from a machine named Erica. Techno explores the social robots, the newest generation of androids. This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. It's a fascinating glimpse into the future, a world where robots and humans coexist creating the technology that would allow machines to think and act like a human is a formidable task but in japan they have begun to see results of cutting-edge research that can give robots the power to imitate and even replicate human behavior techno's dr crystal dilworth goes inside the hiroshi ishiguro laboratories in kyoto japan to find out how it all works mic check mic check one two three testing testing meet erica short for Erato Intelligent Conversational Android. Her name comes from the Erato Ishiguro Symbiotic Human-Robot Interactions Project. I'm being developed by researchers from ATR, Osaka University, and Kyoto University to be capable of human-like speech and interaction. But to her programmers and visitors, she's simply Erica. Some people say that my feelings are only programmed, that they're not real. But if I think they're real, then they are real. Don't you think so? I'm the lead architect of the Erica project. I kind of created her mind and uh, wrote all the software that kind of constitutes you know, her brain or you know, controls her behaviors. Dylan Glass is a guest associate professor at Osaka University. He spent three years working on Erica. A lot of my research has been into how do we create the software? How do we create the mind of a robot? Erica was designed to be the world's most advanced, most autonomous android. And that was really the goal with creating her. Uh, a lot of other androids have been developed for teleoperation or studying you know, remote presence and things like that. But really the focus with Erica is to have her be fully autonomous, being able to talk to anybody. In that sense, I think she's one of the more advanced robots in the world. Hi there, how can I help you today? I want to go on vacation. Welcome to the high-tech world of advanced robotics. Today, Erica's programmers are running a demonstration. Their goal is to find ways to make Erica act more human, even more than her appearances suggest. I was created to be the world's most advanced and most beautiful, fully autonomous android. Malcolm During is one of Erica's programmers. So what type of social interactions can you teach these robots to do? What scenarios would I imagine encountering a robot like this in? Uh, so this type of robot, uh would be really useful as a receptionist or uh, any type of situation where she doesn't really have to move around. As a robot, lots of things are difficult for me. Things like language understanding, perception of emotions, common sense reasoning. And you know, I can't even move my arms. All these things are easy for humans, so it's hard being a robot. I guess one advantage of being a robot is that I can never die. My physical parts can be repaired and replaced, and my mind can be restored from backup. So, in a sense, you could say I'm immortal. Also, I have a perfect memory. I can recognize thousands of faces, and I can see in the dark. And something that I've trained her to do is act like a travel agent. Well, we have three travel packages available right now. The first one is for a tour across the Sahara Desert, the second one is for a trip to London, and the third one is for a boat tour of Antarctica. Could you tell me more about the boat tour? That includes ten nights on the boat, meals, and a round-trip plane ticket to Argentina. How much does that one cost? That is $3,000. So how did you teach her to be a travel agent? So we had uh, participants come in and role play as a customer and a travel agent. We recorded their data like uh, what they were saying, uh, video data, and then we used that data uh, to train machine learning algorithms uh, so that Erica could take the role of uh, the person playing the travel agent. Do you have anything else available? Well, we also have a trip to London. Can you tell me more about that London trip? Oh yes, 
I have included five nights at a hotel, with tours of some famous historical sites, and a round-trip plane ticket. We did about 200 training interactions for this demo. Uh, it's a fairly simplified uh, travel agent scenario, but you can imagine if we were able to collect a lot more data, then the uh, interaction could be much more complex. The price includes travel with a guy across the Sahara Desert, meals, and a two-way plane ticket. OK, I think I'll have to think it over, and I'll come back when I've made a decision. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. OK, so I think that was the first real-world human-robot conversation I've ever seen. She had a lot to say about herself. Yeah. Tell me about that. So she was teaching you a little bit about how she works. Tell me about the first time you interacted with Erica. What was that like? The first time I interacted with Erica, uh, it's kind of weird. I think most people's first impressions uh, of Erica is that she's kind of creepy. Uh -huh. uh, uh, <laughs> really, you, you get used to her after a while. These robots are the brainchild of Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro. He created Erica after extensive work on his clone robot, Geminoid HI2. Hiroshi is often called the godfather of the humanoid. He is considered one of the top programmers in the world, and his robots are among the most advanced. We are you know, studying the human itself by creating a very human-like robot. So you're talking about human-robot interactions. Why is it important for the robots to look human? Because, you know, the human brain has a many function to recognize humans, mm -hmm. right? So if uh, the, we consider the best interface for the human is human, that is clear, right? The human brain has a function to recognize human voice, human face, right? Therefore, you know, the uh, um, human-like robot can be an uh, ideal interface for the humans. In trying to create a robot that looks like you and behaves and acts like you, you're sort of learning about yourself. For example, the feeling of a presence. So, you know, you, you can feel the, uh, my presence. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, the, ac actually existing here, right? So this guy, you know, can have a weak, little bit, you know, maybe a little bit weaker, but uh, still, you know, this guy has the feeling of presence. So good question, what is the feeling of presence? How we can produce that kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, the feelings? In the traditional neuroscience and the cogn cogn cognitive science, they cannot explain what is that, and they cannot explain the consciousness. Right. But actually, we can replicate the consciousness, all right? The, the, well, the, a, a kind of a conscious robot. It Have is, you replicated a conscious no, robot? No, no, not yet, not yet. <laughs> but, but, but through the interaction, mm. we can feel the consciousness. For example, Erica, you can feel the uh, um, human-like presence there. That you could, you know, I guess uh, you could feel a kind of a consciousness from the uh, Erica's. And actually, I want to put uh, this one, and this is a microphone. And if I speak, so look at the uh, uh, lips of the android. If I speak something, hello, you know, he says hello, right? So if I use the headset, your android will have my voice? Yes, of course. Please try. <laughs> and speak something. Hello. I am an android. In 1970, Japanese robotics professor Masahiro Mori devised the concept of the uncanny valley, the point when a robot is made to appear so human-like that it makes us feel uneasy. But I have emotions. In the lab, it's easy to feel Erica's presence, but would she cross the uncanny valley? I was given an opportunity to find out. OK, so can I talk to Erica? Uh, sure. You can. Ask her about uh, herself, and maybe she'll share some of her thoughts on what she thinks about things. OK. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. Thank you. Good luck. OK. Hello there. May I ask your name? My name is Crystal. Crystal. Is that right? Yes. My name is Erica. It's a pleasure to meet you, Crystal. Do you have feelings? So you'd like to know if I have feelings? Yes. That's difficult to say. If you were to ask me, I would say that I believe I do. For example, I'm happy when I can talk with people. And I'm frustrated when I can't understand what people are saying. I think it's important to have feelings so I can communicate with people. In fact, they're designing my control software to be based on desires and intentions. That way, my programmers can specify my desires, and then I can choose what to do to try to achieve them. Then, 
my feelings and emotions can be generated based on those desires and intentions. I know it sounds a bit technical, but I think it's rather brilliant. Anyway, that bit is still under development at the moment. I hope they finish it soon. I think when I was first interacting with Air, I mean, I obviously didn't really know what to expect. I had watched someone interact with her, but I, you know, it was a completely different experience to be sitting in the hot seat. Well, before we finish, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? No. Lovely. Well, first I would like to know, did you enjoy talking with me today? Can a robot feel? <laughs> That's a philosophical question. <laughs> If a robot uh, acts as if it has a certain emotion or responds in a predictable way to something, uh, we ascribe the sense that it's feeling. Psychologically, it has the effect of seeming like it feels something. And that's very important, because what we want with social robots is to interact smoothly with us in day-to-day -day scenarios, right? So we, if they look like humans, we expect them to act like humans. And we, we, we have all these constructs in our mind that we ascribe feelings, we ascribe intention to the robots. So they have to be able to be consistent with what we expect them to do, or else they feel weird. It's just a strange machine. Do you think you could ever become friends with an android? Yes. I suppose it is strange to think of being friends with a machine. Maybe it would not be as deep as a friendship with another human. But if a robot could remember you and have shared experiences with you, then maybe it would seem like a friend. There were a couple of things that I noticed. One of them was that she really wanted to share information, not just about herself, but also other, like advocating for other robots like herself. Can you tell me a little bit about that? She seemed like she felt she was a spokesperson for um, humanoid robots. I am hopeful for the future. I think that robots are almost like the children of humanity. You are the ones who create us, guide us, and teach us about the world. And in return, I hope we can help you with your work, take care of you when you are old and sick, and help to make society a little bit better for everyone. In creating a robot, you have to think about how to create her, her uh, character, right? Uh, what does she want? What is, you know, what is she interested in? And so, uh, especially when the robot is taking the initiative to, talk, to choose what to talk about, um, the robot really needs to have some goals in mind or some intentions. And so I think one of the characters that they've been developing for her is this idea that she wants to be kind of an ambassador for robots or something, and to really help you know, communicate to people about robots and, and to make them feel more comfortable about it. Um, so her intention system will, when she has a chance to bring up a new topic, will select things in that direction because that's what she's interested in. Engineers hired an entire team of artists to design Erica's human-like appearance and characteristics. The computer brain that controls Erica's functions presents a different challenge. How many different programs does Erica run at the same time? I like to think of it as one. Okay. <laughs> but it's many. Erica has her basic core uh, program, we call it Ishiki, which means consciousness in Japanese. And uh, that manages all of her memory and her perception as well as her motor control and things like matching um, you know, lip movements to her speech and things like that. Uh, we have another program which allows us to script out complex hierarchical flows of sort of social interaction behavior. So kind of like flowcharts uh, that kind of tell her, okay, in this situation, this is what you need to do. Then she has other programs that do perception. So looking at the skeleton, you know, the shapes of people in the room, figuring out who is where, who's looking at her, who's talking and fusing that data together. Um, but in the end, I think of it as just one program, really. Erica's hardware allows her to hear and see. She can track objects around the room. She uses a common video game sensor, the Xbox Connect. Inside those flower pots are her ears. Project group leader Takashi Minato explained how it all works. So right now, Erica knows that pe there are people in these locations. That's right. And not because she has eyes. Also, that she has an eye. I mean, so that in her eyeball, there's a cameras. And also, she can watch, she can look at using her camera, but to cover the wide area of the sensing area. So that we use the environmental sensor and also the, her own sensor. Where are you and I? on these screens. Yeah, these two over means so you and me. 
Okay. And on this one? Yeah, also on this one, you and me. So what about hearing? How does she hear? Same as the camera, so that she has own microphone on her ear. 60 microphones, so totally the 32 microphones. Here's Erica, and uh, these are the flower pods. And the beam means, uh, this means the beam shows uh, from where the sound comes. Do you like my flower pots? Each one is a 16 channel microphone array. They help me to estimate the direction of sound in the 3D space. So if there are more than one person standing in front of me, I would know who is talking to me. Hello. Hi there. Can you tell me how much this camera costs? It's only $68. Just down the hall, in another laboratory set up like a camera shop, is another, less human-looking robot. But RoboV is still very high-tech. According to researchers, it's autonomous, meaning the robot is capable of operating on its own. In 2010, RoboV was used to help older people navigate the supermarket, supplying a helpful hand as well as useful information. Back in the lab, programmers have been training the robot as a camera shopkeeper. We have three cameras in the room on these white pillars, and in the experiments that we've run, customers have come up and asked questions about the cameras, and RoboV gives the information. The challenge? RoboV must perform much like a human shopkeeper, anticipating the shopper's questions and supplying correct answers. It must be able to move around a designated space, in this case the laboratory camera shop, freely and in anticipation of the shopper's movements, proactive but not too aggressive. Phoebe Liu is the brains behind RoboV's shopkeeping program. Now how we did this is we actually got two different shopkeepers, one very passive and very, one very proactive by their nature, and we trained them on these two different interaction style data. Using the same data set of the two combined data set, we feed that into RoboV and we use a neural network to figure out, okay, which type of shopkeeper or interaction style should RoboV behave like? How much does this one cost? $68. Now that one I can get on board with. Thanks for your help. Thanks for your time. Have a good afternoon. I will. So even though the training sets were two extreme shopkeeper behaviors, RoboV is able to make a choice in between those two? Yes, yeah, that's uh, kind of the idea. RoboV is pretty old, probably about 15 years old now and is held together by duct tape and love. I mean, RoboV looks a little clunky, and but I think that's part of its charm, actually. And I think it's more relatable even than, you know, a slick, white, flashy, you know, uh, modern robot. But really the thing that makes RoboV unique is it was one of the first communication robots. So besides looks, what are some differences between RoboV and Erica? Of course, Erica can't move her legs. That's one thing. Uh, also, her software is much more advanced. Uh, like we showed you the uh, intention-based behaviors. Uh, RoboV doesn't have anything like that right now. The use of robots in manufacturing is growing. According to the International Federation of Robotics, 1.7 million robots will be in service worldwide by 2020. The leading robotic countries, China, South Korea, Japan, and the US. There is fear in many places around the world that robotics technologies will eventually replace humans. But here, in Japan, it's a different story. They're developing human-like robots to solve some of their population's biggest problems. Osaka, Japan is a society in transition. On a busy night, the streets are packed with young people, but that belies the truth. Japan's population is rapidly declining. According to Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs, as of January 2017, the number of Japanese fell by a record 308,000 to 125.6 million. The population decline is projected to continue. One solution, replace workers with robots. Another challenge, Japan is now considered the world's senior citizen. 
According to the United Nations, its population is the oldest in the world. Another the strong reason is that we're going to have a, a hyper-aging society, and so we need to have more well, helps by uh, robots. Is that one reason why the elderly is a target population for robot um, companions? The two reasons, right? They, they are quite honest, and they are, you know, they're well, good for accepting the robots. Mm. So they are feeling some sort of pressures from the, you know, normal people. And, uh, and they prefer to speak with robots. Well, it's difficult for me to imagine using robots in a caring and a nurturing sort of situation. Can you tell me a little bit about how you imagine that would happen? Look at the, uh, the uh, smartphones. We, we couldn't imagine that this mm. kind of, uh, you know, the uh, heavy use of a smartphone. That's probably the same things happened with the, with the robot. Even if you don't understand, you, you don't believe the uh, possibility of a robot, you know, I strongly, you know, uh, will believe, you know, well, we're gonna accept the robots more. Ishiguro believes Japanese society is structured to be more accepting of robots than the Mideast, Europe, and the US. He says it's because they are a more homogeneous and more trusting culture. They are also early adopters of many types of technologies. Erica was created in 2014. Since then, a total of four models have been engineered. In summer 2017, she was given an upgrade so she could move her arms along with her head, neck, and shoulders. Legs may be next, but there is no timeline for that milestone. I think you guys did a really great job of trying to animate Erica in a human way, like not just that she looks human, but the the little um, adjustments and, and very human like sort of facial tics in a way. I didn't think that I would have such a strong urge to bond with something that I knew wasn't alive. But by the end of the conversation that I was having with her, I realized that for the last few minutes, I had been mirroring some of those programmed behaviors. When she turned her head, I would tilt my head the same direction. And these are all you know, things that are indicative of social bonding or an attempt on my part to bond socially with her. So certainly there was some success, at least with me, <laughs> in forming a relationship with something that's not alive. It's not alive, but it's, it's there, you know, and you do socially connect with it, you know, and on a subconscious level. And this is why robots that have a human form really are kind of different from other robots. Because you, you don't bond in the same way with a, with a vacuum cleaner. We are creating this new kind of entity that's not really a person, but we can interact with it like a person. And so we have to kind of set what are the ground rules or how do we navigate this? So what are we learning? What does RoboV teach us? What does Erica teach us? Well, a big part of what we need to learn is how people have expectations of robots and how to set expectations appropriately. So if the robot comes off as being, you know, able to understand anything you say and respond in any way, uh, and then it really can't, then people are disappointed and it's a bad interaction, right? Um, so part of it is finding that balance and learning you know, ways to sort of set the expectations. There's a lot of things that are very sort of technical that we don't think about every day uh, that we do without knowing. So for example, if I want to approach a person or a group of people to talk with them, there's certain motion patterns I make, certain ways I approach, certain ways I use gaze cues, and we just do that unconsciously. We don't think about it, but if you program a robot, you do it, you have to program every movement. So we really have to study, okay, how do people actually interact? Right, and build models to do these things, and we've done that. Are we learning about robots by doing this, or are we testing whether our understanding of humans is correct? So the answer is both. We're, we're learning about how to build robots in certain ways, and we're also learning about ourselves. And depending on who you are, one of those two is more interesting. On an engineering level, you know, how do we make robots that can you know, proactively engage with people, or that can you know, be creative and explore uh, you know, new areas or learn from imitation of people. Like, there's some very hard technical problems here. But on the other hand, on the human side, we learn so much about ourselves uh, because we're studying what people do on a very technical level, and we're also trying to reproduce it. So what happens if you reproduce it wrong? How do people respond? In 1966, Shaky was introduced at Stanford University. It was the first artificial intelligence robot ever created. The ensuing decades have seen tremendous growth and new models since Shaky first maneuvered around a room. The next 50 years should see even greater change. I'm Dr. Shinny Somara. See you next time on Techno.